So I'm Keenan Dufty, and I'm here at the Red Devil Lounge with music and style icon Midjour, who's the voice of Ultravox and the co-creator of Band-Aid and Live Aid, which you may have heard of. Big things. So Midge, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. And uh, you're in the midst of an American tour. We are first uh, first one with the band for over 25 years. That's a long wow. time. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of water under the bridge since since then. <laughs> Just a bit, yeah. It's, it's it's interesting coming back and doing it all again, but uh, it's been fun. So I was sort of thinking earlier about the the sort of many iconic bands that you fronted over the years, and um, first of all, Slick, who are amazing and very stylish guys. I mean, you know, that whole sort of 50s baseball jacket look that you had was really a lot iconic, I think, at the time. Well, it was a time when, uh, you know, you had bands like, uh, I suppose it was, the, it was the teen pop era. Right. So it was just pre-punk and uh, a time when all these kind of pretty boy bands were around, the Bay City Rollers and the like. And, uh, you know, everyone had long hair, everyone had long kind of feather cut hair, a bit like a, a glorified mullet. <laughs> and I remember the drummer from Slick and I went to see, uh, I think it was a Dirty Harry movie. And we came out and said, we have to have those haircuts. So we went off to the barbers and got ourselves these 50s kind of, you know, quiffs. Uh, and it, the style just kind of emanated from that, that sure. 50s, you know, old baseball shirts. And, and it was and totally stuff. rebellious at the time. It, it was, was, but it's interesting that the, the, the look at the time, this was 1976, it was, it was the kind of forerunner, it was a precursor to what was about to happen. Right. You know, when we came to London to play shows in London, because we were a Glasgow, Scotland based band, um, you'd meet all these kids, uh, the, the Bromley contingent they were called, and all these kids all looked like, you know, American GIs. They all had kind of greased back hair and smart uh, shirts with ties tucked inside the, the front of the shirt. Really cool looking guys. And of course, these were the, these were the guys who were about to alter the way fashion, uh, the way the look of youth was forever. Sure. So after Slick kind of like exploded onto the scene, you, you nearly, or so I'm told by our mutual friend Glenn Matlock, you nearly joined the Sex Pistols. Yeah, well, I was asked to join a band. Uh, I was in Glasgow coming out to a music shop when I was stopped in the street by this English guy who said, can I, can I speak to his friend around the corner? Um, the, the guy who stopped me turn, uh, turned out to, you know, he was Bernie Rhodes, the man who went on to manage The Clash. Right. And the guy, his friend around the corner in the car was Malcolm McClam. Uh, and he, he was the most uh, outrageous, kind of slightly effeminate looking man that I'd ever seen in Glasgow at the time. <laughs> and um, he talked about his background and he talked about this band he was putting together. Uh, and after half an hour of talking to this guy, uh, and him asking if I would, I would join the band, he hadn't asked if I was a musician. So I, I just thought, well, this, this just doesn't make sense. So I, I turned it down, and of course, lo and behold, the band was the Pistols. I've no idea what role he wanted me to play. I think he <laughs> wanted me because I'd just had my hair cut. So I had this, I, I was looking different from everybody else at the time. I was gonna say, I wondered if that was the, his prompts. That you I think it probably it was. It was, the, it was the look that I had. You know, it was the straight trousers as opposed to the flares and spec heeled boots that everyone else seemed to be wearing sure. in the mid 70s. So I think the look was what prompted me. Well, people forget how uh, kind of the 70s were sort of almost like the dark ages until the, the kind of new wave and punk explosion and guys like yourself having a totally different look to the way everybody else looked. And that must have been kind of, you know, tough in Scotland because I remember growing up in, in Yorkshire, it was, it was pretty hard. It, it was hard, except, you know, we had a few a few people that, you know, you respect and admire, a few followers, musicians. You know, Roxy Music came out in 72. David Bowie had been around for a while. So there were a few kind of fashion icons who broke the mold. Right. So they had kind of eased the way a bit for something that was a little different. It was still tough, you know, uh, walking around the streets of Glasgow uh, at the time looking a little different. And you saw what happened, you know, a year or so later in London when the whole new wave punk explosion happened and these kids walking about dressed the way they were. It was quite intimidating to your average guy in the street. Um, you know, so it, I suppose fashion revolutions do that. They rattle the cage and they, they upset a few people and then it becomes high street fashion. Sure. So, so eventually, I have to pull a bit of your past out here. You did get together 
with our friend Glenn. I did. And front the rich kids, which uh, this is the debut single, which I bought the day it came out, folks, and still have, despite <laughs> many, many plays. So you were telling me a little bit about this, how it became about, because it's you know the red vinyl is so brilliant. Well, the rich kids were great. I mean, the rich kids were put together by you know Glenn Matlock, ex Sex Pistols. So although I didn't join the Sex Pistols, I ended up teaming up with Glenn a year later. And um, <clears throat> fortunately, when I joined the band, they had a fantastic uh, artist uh, who was almost, he was kind of the manager, but not. He was like the guy in the, the, the band who couldn't play, but he designed, he, he, came, you know, he, he came from uh, you know, art school. And uh, Malcolm, Malcolm McDowell, who's now gone on to work in movies, you know, doing set design and things. Um, and he, we came up, between us, we came up with this fantastic thing. Malcolm, uh, 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 he, he, came, he came up with these fantastic graphics, this kind of Russian-esque imagery. And I remember saying to EMI in a meeting uh, about this first single coming out, mentioning the fact that uh, could we do it on, you know, asking if we could do it in colour vinyl. And they said, what's colour vinyl? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, children's nursery uh, records, you know, right. uh, little EPs, yeah. they, they, print, they press them up in these fantastic colours. Sure. He said, I've never heard of that. So we went off and we, we did this. And of course, the moment this came out, every new wave band had to have colour, clear, luminous vinyl. You know, it was it became a big, big okay. thing. But this is such an iconic collector's oh, yeah. item. This, oh, it's fantastic. You know? And even even to the extent where we get that, where we did the thing where we got the blueprint against the the, the red background. Right. It was a, a Malcolm McDowell uh, 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 thing. Uh, 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 it it just it did this weird eye thing. It yeah. makes your <laughs> eyes vibrate. Right. The colours really clash against each right. other. So we just loved the whole idea of the graphics. The graphics back then started to become really important, yeah. really important. Well, it's part of a, an overall image that I think, you know, the, the punk new wave uh, generation kind of created that sort of total package, but not in a pre-packaged kind of boy band way, just in, in a really artistic, you know, kind of conceptual way that wasn't pretentious like the prog rockers, but it was just vibrant and modern and really like now. And it was, and it was all a bit, um, <clears throat> it was all a bit homemade, a bit right. like the music at the time. Right. You know, the music was about rebellion, and music was about if you think you can do it, just go out and do it. And it was the same with the graphics. So uh, you know, you look at the the, the, the pistols, you know, you never mind sleeve, uh, and it's it's just all kind of torn out, it's ripped up and stuck together, but bit beautifully done. Yeah. It's now an iconic piece of art. Sure. So the graphics. Uh, going hand in hand with the music for the first time ever, rather than the record company just saying, we need a smiley photograph of the band and right. put that on the sleeve. Right. This was all about, it went hand in hand, just as eventually the pop videos that, that went with the music, the, the video clips that mm -hmm. went with the music, um, had to be an, an extension of the music itself. Right. So forever, from that moment on, it all gelled together. It sure. all had to come from the one source, and the source was the artists. Mm. And, and, and record companies at the time didn't really understand it. They'd kind of, every record company had to have a punk band. They sent, they sent the Rain Hara guys <laughs> out and said, get me a punk band, because they've got one, they've got, we need a punk band. So they signed anything. Right. So they just let these bands do whatever they wanted, because they didn't understand it. <laughs> so it was brilliant, it was the ultimate revolution. That's great. So, so after Rich Kids, you kind of then became the, the and, and probably the band that you're, you're probably most known for is as the, the, the leader of Ultravox. And, um, you know, Ultravox were one of those bands that had been around for a while and had some records out. And I think when you joined them, they were, they didn't have a singer, they didn't have a guitarist, sure. they didn't have a record deal. So you, you sort of came on board and breathed new life into that band. I think that's what it was. It was just the right combination of people. I would. I would be dreadfully big-headed if I thought it was me who made the whole thing happen. I think the, the shake-up within the band, you know, the three of the band were left, uh, the main nucleus of the band. And when I came in, it was, it was new and fresh and vibrant. You know, I was really excited about joining these guys. Sure. Um, you know, I, uh, the, the, the thing that broke the rich kids up was a synthesizer. I bought a synthesizer, which Glenn hated. <laughs> and I, I saw this whole thing about um, using electronics together with traditional rock instrumentation, guitars and drums and bass and all of that stuff. Um, and Glenn hated that, but I took the idea on and uh, actually put together the, the idea of Visage uh, to work 
with my favourite musicians, one of which was Billy Curry, keyboard player with Ultrabox, yep. uh, the guys from the band uh, Magazine, yep. and uh, Rusty Egan, the drummer from The Rich Kids. Right. And we put together Visage with Steve Strange. And through working on Visage, I ended up joining Ultravox. Uh, so yes, it was, again, everything that had happened in 75, uh, 76, when bands started putting graphics, imagery, photography, uh, videos, all of it together in the package. It, by the time the late 70s came along when mm. I joined Ultravox, everything was set. All of a sudden, we, were, we had the tools at our fingertips to take it on to the next level. And that kind of caused an explosion in the British music scene, which eventually, you know, you had that second wave invasion of America where all the British bands were coming over here and having huge success on MTV. And I think, you know, Ultravox were one of the bands that kind of created the music video. You know, with, I mean, with Vienna, they're so iconic and so close to, I mean, I, I wonder what your favorite films are because, you know, they're, they're so classic, all of the music videos that you make. Well, I suppose back, back in the day, it was kind of film noir-esque, wasn't it? It was very European. Mm. But Ultravox's music was very European. It was so un-American. Uh, it's no wonder that we didn't really, uh, didn't really crack it here. Um, but it was very European, so therefore all the imagery was very European. Uh, we, we were lucky enough to work with uh, a guy called Peter Saville, who was a brilliant graphics guy, still is. Uh, and we designed some fantastic sleeves. And uh, so the artwork was incredibly important to us, really important, almost as important as the music, uh, the imagery, the posters, uh, and that led on to uh, making the, the pop videos. So when we made a, uh, the video for, say, Vienna, which is the, a kind of seminal you know, moment, sure. um, you know, we insisted it was shot in film, not video. Uh, we, insist we cropped the screen top and bottom to make it look like cinema school. Right. It was black and white, it was very grainy, it was long shadows on wet cobblestones, it was shadows on the wall, it was, it was all film noir. Um, and of course, once other artists saw this, they all had to have one. <laughs> so our director at the time, Russell Mulcahy, went on to do videos for Duran and Spandau and Elton John and a whole sure. slew of other artists. So uh, when MTV started, which kind of broke a lot of those bands in America, the only content they had was European content. Right. They didn't have video clips. Uh, they soon caught up and started doing them. <laughs> so a lot of the content at the beginning of MTV was all of that European imagery. Now, I have to ask you about the probably the, the I guess the biggest moment of the 80s in, in sort of popular culture, which was Live Aid. And um, you're uh, the co-writer of the Band Aid, Do They Know It's Christmas single, the co-organizer of Live Aid. I think it's one of the most seismic shifts in social consciousness in the last sort of three decades. Mm -hmm. And it really was the success that George Harrison's concert for Bangladesh kind of wasn't. You know, Live Aid set a new bar and it's continued. And, and it's and great all credit to you and to Bob Geldof and to everyone else that was involved in that. And what was it like being at the center of that fantastic movement? Well, I, I, I think before I tell you, I have to, I have to say that not many people know this, but it was George Harrison who gave us the first piece of advice when Bob and I were putting this together. And he said, get good accountants and make sure the money goes where it's meant to go, because that kind of backfired on, sure. on him, yeah. uh, which we took on board, I have to say, which was fantastic. Um, it was phenomenal uh, being part of this because it, it's one of those uh, ridiculous situations where you really can't see the wood for the trees because you're right in the middle of this whirlwind. Yeah. When we, when we decided that the only thing that Bob and I were fit to do was write a song, and we decided we wanted to write a Christmas song. It was very cold and calculated, what we were doing. Mm. We wanted to achieve a number one record in the UK because the charts freeze over Christmas. Mm. Uh, therefore, you can sell two or three times as much uh, content uh, right. as, you, as you normally would. Um, so that was, that, that was set in stone. That's what we, we did. When, when we made the record, we had 24 hours to record all the vocalists, do Phil Collins' drums and mix the record in order to get it into the pressing plants the next morning. Yeah. Otherwise, we would miss the Christmas market. Um, and I remember driving home the morning after we did this, very bleary eyed. And as I drove home, Bob took a cassette of this recording to the BBC. And as I'm driving home, I heard the song we'd just made being played on national Fantastic. radio and they played it every hour on the hour and I realised at that moment something seismic, there's a huge seismic shift here. 
And of course, that led on to uh, you know realizing that the money we generated, we hoped to generate a hundred thousand pounds, which it was a lot of money at the time. We ended up the record generated seven million pounds, and still generates it today because every time it's played on the radio, the money goes to Africa. That's great. Um, we realized that something else needed to be done. It was just a, we were only scratching the surface. Here. Sure. So Live Aid was born. And what a fantastic event, you know, global. I mean, it was uh, amazing. It was uh, scary. Uh, <laughs> you know, at a time when, you know, telephones were like a, you know, they weighed as much as a small brick and uh, you couldn't make a call to anyone else with a mobile phone because you didn't know anyone else with a mobile phone. Everything had to be done across the Atlantic via telex. So sure. no internet, no, you know, you, it was a, a long slog to try and put this global event on. It had never been done before. Right. Uh, and it was scary stuff. Now I have to I have to go to back to something frivolous because I did bring along some these fantastic magazines, The Face, which mm. was so mm. iconic in the eighties. Some great style in here, um, particularly your good self. I, I love this picture of Midge with his Jeep. And um, when you when you sort of look back at these kind of iconic images, um, what what do you what do you think about the, the sort of style of the eighties now? Because it did get a bit of bashing for a while, but it looks fresh to me again. It got a lot of a bashing from the uh, from the general media. The face was a was a, a fashion oriented art magazine anyway, so it was fairly uh, fairly open. The general music media gave mm. a lot of the artists at the time a, a serious bashing, probably on par with what uh, bands in the 60s got from the general media as well. Right. You know, it was all effeminate. The Beatles haircut was all effeminate, ridiculous and <laughs> stupid. And a lot of the stuff that happened in the early 80s, yeah, it was a bit silly and a bit camp and a bit over the top. But the music was incredible. Sure. You know, what came out of that, the music was great. The music spun the fashion. You could go to the Blitz Club in, in London. Uh, if you were allowed in, you had to look right before you were allowed. Well, you in. had the in because you I, I was there. I, I, I was allowed in anyway. Uh, but but you had to you had to you be, be of a certain style before you're allowed in the door. But you could stand there next to Boy George, who was next to you know, uh, uh, you know a fashion designer or a filmmaker or you know a, a journalist or whatever. Right. And it was just this hodgepodge of creative activity. Sure. And that's kind of what it was. And the whole early 80s, although it was kind of dismissed as a bit, a bit silly, most of that music is still played on the radio today. Right. Most of that style is still iconic style. And a bit like an old uh, picture book, an old photograph book, if you look back far enough, we're all going to find something you're embarrassed about. Of course, yeah. You know, a haircut, uh, something you wore that you think, what, what ever possessed me to wear that? <laughs> So, you know, there are elements of it that you'll be mildly embarrassed about. But having a flick through these, I think it's fantastic. It's great. And I, you know, as recently I saw pictures of your good self, the guys from Spandau Ballet, Steve Strange, in Luomo Vogue, the Italian men's Vogue, from, I think, two summers ago, mm -hmm. shot by Ian McKell. Yep. And it looked timeless and it looked classic. And you kind of, you had the, the sort of style, the classic style of New Romantic, but it was updated. And it was done in a way that kind of looked cool today. Well, I think, uh, you know, that, I think it's a very different thing. I think fashion and style are two different things. Mm. I think style is something you have. It's your own personal stamp. Fashion is, uh, you know, what you stick around yourself to make yourself cool. Right. But the coolness comes from inside. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's an element. Where, uh, there are moments when it kind of gels and it, it works. And there are other moments where, you know, I've seen myself videos and photographs where my shoulder pads wouldn't have got through the door. <laughs> uh, you know, PX clothes, which uh, you, you, yeah, uh, you yeah. said that you, you worked at. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, there are moments when you, you, you dig out your old Gautier suits and you think, whatever possessed me. <laughs> but at that moment in time, that was the coolest thing you could possibly wear. Absolutely. So who are your style icons? And you mentioned Roxy Music. And when, when you were kind of, when you were sort of growing up, who did you look to for um, those kind of, who, who did you think had real style? You know what? I think there's, um, you know, I think there are elements of, of, you know, musicians that you think I love what they did. I love the fact that Bowie was completely out there, and then he completely changed. So he'd kill off the character and the, you know, you know, design himself a new character, sure. and that was great because that kept everyone guessing. Yeah. You know, there was a moment where the, the, the Blitz was full of all these artistic people, right. really cool, and then Bowie came to the Blitz one night, and all these cool people melted. 
you know, you could see them running around like headless chickens because the, the king was there, you know. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it, it's quite interesting. I think ultimate style icon for me, Fred Astaire. Uh, you look at a man who had just threw his clothes together, wore them incredibly well, great flair, yeah. great panache, mm. and it didn't seem to be fashion oriented. Right. It was personal style. Right. Well, you're a style icon yourself, sir. Thank you Thank you, you so much. much for taking the time to talk to us. Looking forward to the show tonight. That should be fun. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's been Enjoy. a pleasure. Thank you.